Hey there, historians! Imagine you're a high school student in modern England. Maybe you wear a cool uniform, attend class in an old brick building, and play a little football in your off time. Easy enough to imagine, right? Especially if you are a high school student in modern England. Now let's rewind the clock. No further, a lot further. Way, way back, before Viking raids, barbarian invaders, druids, and even Stonehenge. I'm talking all the way back to the prehistoric England of 4000 BCE. Here in 4000 BCE, you don't go to school in an old brick building because there is no building and no school. Your education consists of tagging along with a group of hunters as they stalk a herd of prehistoric wild oxen called aurochs. Oxen, you say? Aren't those kind of like cows? Yeah, but what if I told you full-grown aurochs were six feet tall at the shoulders, weighed 1,500 pounds, and were highly aggressive with massive horns, and also very, very fast. Oh, and this? was your hunting weapon. Not so easy, right? So your family moves from place to place, setting up primitive camps wherever the Aurochs go. And if the hunt is successful, you'll survive the winter. If not, you'll try to survive on nuts and berries. This is your life in prehistoric England. And as far back as anyone in your family can remember, this is how it's always been. Until one day, some guy shows up in your camp from somewhere else. He looks healthy. He sounds pretty smart too, talking about this crazy new idea called agriculture. He's saying, you don't have to stock wild oxen anymore, guys. You can plant and harvest crops like wheat and barley, and you'll be fine for winter. Not only that, you can domesticate the oxen and use them to help you farm. And this new idea changes everything. It brings new tools, new skills, predictable food sources, and the luxury of staying in one place. But it also turns your life upside down. Because now, on the promise of an easier life, you and everyone you know must adapt to a whole new way of doing things. And the skills you had before no longer apply. Your new reality known as agrarian life that is, life related to the cultivation of the land, would also be the reality of your descendants for the next 6,000 years. Until one day, some guy shows up with this crazy new idea called industry, which changes everything again, leading to one of the most profound transformations in world history, a transformation known as the Industrial Revolution. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Our guiding questions are, how did most people live just prior to the Industrial Revolution? Why did the Industrial Revolution begin in England? And how did the early English textile industry affect the United States? Our big picture question is, how did the Industrial Revolution fundamentally change the way people lived and worked? people in early 18th century England were still living relatively quiet lives in the countryside. Farmers planted crops on small strips of land, while their animals and their neighbors' animals grazed on shared fields. But that began to change when Parliament passed a series of laws called the Enclosure Acts, which created legal property rights to ground that was previously held in common. Soon, the wealthy began scooping up huge amounts of land and enclosing it with fences and hedges, a process known as the enclosure movement. Enclosure forced small farmers to become tenants, that is, people who occupied land rented from a landlord, while landlords began experimenting with new planting machines, like the seed drill, and new harvesting techniques, like 
four-field crop rotation, and selective livestock breeding to increase their yields. These innovations led to a revolution in agricultural productivity, with more and more machines doing work previously done by human beings, and more and more farmers being squeezed out of the countryside into cities, where the development of trade and the rise of business were taking center stage. At the same time, as mechanized farm yields increased, food supplies did too, resulting in a population explosion that provided both the workforce needed in the factories and mines of the growing industrial movement and the consumers to buy the goods being manufactured. Pause here and write down your answer to our first guiding question. How did people live just prior to the Industrial Revolution? If you wrote on farms or in the countryside, give yourself a farthing because you're absolutely right. Now let's think about our big picture question. How did the Industrial Revolution fundamentally change the way people lived and worked? Can you guess how? Pause here and write down your prediction, and at the end of the lesson, we'll see if you were right. We've been talking about England this whole time, but why? Why did industry first take hold there and not somewhere else? To answer that, we need to understand exactly what we mean by industry. In this case, we're talking about the process of using factories to turn raw materials into finished goods. In other words, making stuff instead of growing stuff. So why did England emerge in the early 18th century as the prime candidate for making stuff? First, England had all kinds of natural resources like iron ore for building tools, machines, and buildings, water power and coal, for running mills and new machines, navigable rivers, for transporting goods and materials, and harbors, for facilitating trade and shipping. Second, England was politically stable, with a parliament more interested in encouraging business than in waging war. Third, England's economy was strong, with entrepreneurs investing in manufacturing, bankers providing loans for new machinery, and merchants expanding their overseas trade. At the center of the economy was the textile, or fabric, industry. In the 18th century, much of the world relied on England to provide woven fabrics made of wool, linen, and cotton. English textile makers began to realize they could get rich by speeding up the manufacturing process and reducing their costs. And so began a period of innovation in the English textile industry featuring John Kay's flying shuttle, which doubled the work a weaver could do in a day. James Hargreaves' spinning jenny, which allowed a worker operating a spinning frame to handle eight threads at a time when making yarn. Richard Arkwright's water frame, which used water power from streams rather than hand power to drive spinning wheels. Edmund Cartwright's power loom, which is run by water power and sped up the weaving process. And Samuel Crompton's spinning mule, which combined features of the spinning jenny and the water frame to make better thread than was previously possible. These early machines were expensive to make and often too bulky for homes. So, manufacturers began building up large factories to accommodate them. Pause here and write down your answer to our second guiding question. Why did the Industrial Revolution begin in England? If you wrote, because England was politically stable, economically strong, and full of natural resources, give yourself a penny because you're right again. While the rest of the world relied on England for its textile products, England relied on the United States for its raw cotton. In fact, 80% of England's cotton was grown on huge plantations in the American South. Sounds like a simple arrangement, right? England needed cotton, America grew it. England bought it from America. Except there was one very serious problem. 
Can you guess what that problem was? If you guessed slavery, you're right. These large plantations relied on the labor of enslaved people to pick the cotton, which led to devastating consequences, not only for the enslaved, but also, as we'll see later, for America itself. The problem would only become worse with the advent of new farming technology in the United States. Why? Because cotton was picked by hand, it was hard work. To be useful in textiles, the seeds had to be removed from the raw cotton after harvesting. That was also hard work. Along came Eli Whitney in 1794 with an invention called the cotton gin, which separated the seed from the raw cotton. This new machine increased yields, made plantations more profitable, and created huge demand for more cotton. But remember, the cotton gin didn't harvest the cotton. It only removed the seeds. The cotton still had to be picked by hand, which led to even more enslaved labor in the southern states. Pause here and write down your answer to our third guiding question. How did the early English textile industry affect the United States? If you wrote something like, with its need for raw cotton, the early English textile industry helped shape the economy of the American South, setting the stage for a bitter dispute over slavery within the United States that would eventually erupt into a bloody civil war. Then give yourself a shilling because you nailed it. Imagine now you're an English tenant farmer, and everything you know about your agrarian life you learned from your parents, who learned from their parents, and so on for thousands of years. But now suddenly your landlord raises your rent. New machines begin doing the work you used to do, and you can't afford to farm. So you move to the city and find work in a factory, where you perform the same task hour after hour, day after day. Everything you once knew about farming no longer applies because now you're living a completely different reality. Imagine how disorienting that must have been for the first generation of workers facing the Industrial Revolution. Now, let's take a look at your earlier prediction. What answer did you give for the question, How did the Industrial Revolution change the way people lived and worked? If you wrote something like, it moved people from the country to the city, shifted jobs from farming to manufacturing, and put the world on a path toward global interdependence, then give yourself a pound, because that's exactly what it did. Keep these ideas in mind as we move forward. Consider how drastic the changes brought by industrialization were for the average person. Now, apply that on a worldwide scale and you'll begin to understand just how enormous and how consequential the Industrial Revolution really was. And as always, keep your eyes open because history is everywhere. <laughs>